We'll open your Bibles to the Luke, Luke the 12th chapter. I'm going to read beginning in verse 35. Luke 12, beginning in verse 35. Stay dressed for action and keep your lamps burning. And be like men who are waiting for their master to come home from the wedding feast so that they may open the door to him at once when he comes and knocks. Blessed are those servants whom the master finds awake when he comes. Truly I say to you, he will dress himself for service and have them recline at table and he will come and serve them. If he comes in the second watch or in the third and finds them awake, blessed are those servants. But know this, that if the master of the house had known at what hour the thief was coming, he would not have left his house to be broken into. You also must be ready. For the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. Father, we thank you for this word. Open it to us in a new way, in a powerful way today by the by the power of your Holy Spirit, Lord. And apply it to us and help us not to go away the same we came, but changed just a little bit more to be Christ-like, to be Christ-motivated, to be Christ-centered, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Jesus is coming again. That's the theme of this passage through verse 48. And the message is, because he's coming again, be ready. You must be ready. You know, in my previous life, I worked with the Connecticut State Police at one point in time, had some friends that were among the leadership in that organization. One of them was telling a story one time about how they have a rule in Connecticut that when it starts to snow, it snows a certain amount, you have to put chains on your tires if you're a trooper. It's a pain in the neck, but that's what they asked them to do, demand of them to do. So they got a call one day. The dispatcher was called by somebody, some lady who had been watching, and she said, listen, she said, I just saw one of your patrol cars chasing another car, and it turned over in the ditch. And the dispatcher said, well, what's going on? Is the trooper okay? And she said, well, yeah, I think he's okay, but you better get somebody out here pretty quick because he's standing on top of that turned over car putting chains on the tires. <laughs> he was just a little late. He wasn't ready. And we could be the same way. See, Jesus is urging in this passage, be ready, be ready. Be ready. I'm coming. I'm coming again. You need to be ready. And this follows on the heels, as we mentioned last week, of his warnings about anxiety and his warnings about greed, both of which, to the extent that they're in our lives, which they are, are red flags saying we're not quite ready. We're not as ready as we could be. Because when we really believe that Jesus is coming, those are things that have to flee. Stonewall Jackson, most of you have heard of Stonewall Jackson, the great general for the Confederacy during the Civil War, was not always considered great. He was a devout believer, devout believer. Jackson, probably as much as anybody in that war, was a believer in Jesus Christ, but he was an eccentric. And prior to the war, he taught at VMI, Virginia Military Institute. It's on the same campus as Washington Lee. If you ever get back to Lexington, Virginia, you need to, to visit there. Uh, there's big museums and everything else there. Robert E. Lee is buried there. His horse is buried there. I mean, you can see everything there at Washington and Lee. But, but, but Jackson taught there beforehand, and he was known as kind of a quirky, absent-minded, strange professor. That's how the students viewed him, because... That's pretty much how he was. No one ever dreamed that military genius lay under that facade of eccentricity. But during the first year of the Civil War, many of you, if you know your Civil War history, are aware that one of the great things that happened in that first year is that 
Jackson waged a campaign in the Shenandoah Valley that was a masterpiece of military strategy. He knew the Shenandoah Valley and the ins and outs of it like nobody else. His troops always showed up where they were least expected and taking on far greater numbers, sometimes double and triple the number of men he had. He won, won victory after victory early on in that valley. And someone, a contemporary, made this note about Jackson at that time. This person said, no one would have thought one year ago that Jackson's fame would be spread the wide world over as one of the greatest military captains. He may well be fearless as, now listen to this, he may well be fearless as he is ready to meet his God. His lamp is burning and he waits for the bridegroom. Someone understood the importance of being ready to meet Jesus. And they understood that that was the position that Stonewall Jackson had in his spiritual life as well. Because when we're ready to meet Jesus, anxiety vanishes, worries vanish. We're concentrated on his agenda instead of ours. And that's exactly what Jesus is urging here. Your life needs to change. Now, what do we need to do in order to be ready? I said last week, there's two things. Verses 35 through 40 here, we must be ready by waiting, by, by waiting expectantly. We wait expectantly. And then in verses 41 through 48, by working earnestly. So there's two things. There's both waiting, anticipating, and working. You can't do one, just one or the other. Paul had to get after the Thessalonians who were just waiting because they weren't working anymore. He said, if you don't work, you don't eat. Both are necessary. And both are part of the equation. But as we, we began to look last week, we said the waiting, waiting expectantly consists of four parts. We looked at the first two last week. First, the assurance of his coming. The assurance of his coming. This passage revolves around verse 40. And verse 40 the key thing that he says is, first, we need to know that the Son of Man is coming. The world may mock. They may make fun. They may say, 2,000 years, are you kidding me? Peter reminds us, a day with the Lord is like 1,000 years. 1,000 years is like a day. It's been two, years, two, two days in God time. Jesus is coming again. The timing means nothing. You know what the proof of Jesus coming again is? You know what the proof is? There's proof. The proof is that he came the first time. We are so privileged living on this side of the cross because we can look back and see that in his first coming, all these hundreds of prophecies from the Old Testament are fulfilled literally. Why would we change our mind now and say, well, he's not coming again when that's been promised just as well? It's all going to be fulfilled, beloved. It's all coming. He's coming again. Secondly, we saw that there will be astonishment at his coming. You must be ready. Verse 40, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour that you do not expect. We gave a few, but literally over the last 2,000 years, there have been hundreds of predictions on when Jesus is going to come. None of them so far have turned out to be right. None of them ever will turn out to be right because he's coming when we do not expect it. Nothing prevented Jesus' return in the time of Peter and Paul. Nothing prevents Jesus from coming in our time at any moment. But the timetable is his. And he says, it's gonna, I'm going to come when you least expect it. So in light of that, what do you need to do? Be ready for it anytime. Be expecting it anytime. Be ready. That's the message so that you're not one of those who is astonished at his coming. So those are the first two. Let's look today then at two more elements of waiting, two more things that we need to do in anticipation of his coming. And the third one is anticipate his coming. And he gives us here three ways that we, three, three things that we can do that anticipate his coming. Number one, be unencumbered. Be unencumbered. So we're going to back up now to verse 35 where he says, Stay dressed for action. Stay dressed for action. 
literally reads, gird up your loins. If you have a King James or an old translation like that, that's probably what it says, gird up your loins. It was a common expression in Jesus' time. What did it mean? Well, everybody in those days wore the long robes, right? No jeans in the stuff that we wear. They wore the long robes, togas, whatever. They were very comfortable when you let them hang loose. That's what they did most of the time in that hot environment. But when they really needed to work in order to keep the, the length of that thing out of their way, they had to put a belt on. They girded their loins to get ready for action. So they didn't get find themselves stumbling over their toga, the flowing garment. And so that's the picture when Jesus says, stay dressed for action. I want you to be ready. I want you to be acting. I want you to be active. So what action is he talking about? Glad you asked. Luke 19. Let's go to Luke 19, and we'll see as Jesus gives a parable there, the action that he has in mind is service for the king. Doesn't it make sense if we're expecting his return, we would be serving the king? You say, well, what does that mean? We're in church all the time doing you know, things here? No, it means that every action that he gives us, all of our calling, we can look at it today, but look at 1 Corinthians 7 sometime and find out he says, you follow whatever calling he's given you as he has given you that in order to serve him. So what, wherever God has placed you, whatever your lot in life, wherever you are, there's a mission there for you, for God. And he's saying, I want you to be involved in that. Look at, look at Luke 19, beginning in verse 12. Here's his parable. He says, a nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom. That's Jesus. He's, 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 he's using this parable and he's speaking about himself there. He's going to go away to receive a kingdom. Where's he going? He's going to ascend to the Father. And while he's there, he's going to receive a kingdom, it says. And then he returns. And then verse 13, calling 10 of his servants, he gave them 10 minus and said to them, what? Engage in business until I come. That's our job. Engage in business until I come. Be active about the mission I'm giving you. Be working toward the end that my name is glorified in this earth and in your life. Be active. We're to be about his business. It's not our kingdom that we're to be seeking. It's not, you build a kingdom to yourself and what's going to happen? You're going to die and it's done. But you build a kingdom toward God and you are investing. Those of you who send kids to camp, you have sent money on ahead to heaven. I don't know how it's, that's going to work, but the Lord promises. You're investing in heaven and there will be a day when you will be very glad that you did, you'll only wish you had sent more on ahead. Don't be too entangled in the affairs of this life. Yes, we have to make a living. Yes, we have to engage in our culture. Yes, it's appropriate that we do that. God gives us all things to enjoy. And we need to do that. We need to help, we need to have a, live a flourishing life ourselves and help others live a flourishing life. But that's not the end game. You see, we need to hold this life loosely. It's not the end game. This life is preparation for something that is far greater. And we're either preparing for that or we're wasting time on that which will not last. Paul tells Timothy, 2 Timothy 2 verse 4, share in suffering as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. No soldier gets entangled in civilian pursuits, since his aim is to please the one who enlisted him. Jesus' point is, you're not living for yourself, you're living for me. Whatever you're doing, wherever you're engaged, however your work, to wherever your work takes you, wherever your school takes you, wherever your ambitions take you, make sure that I'm at the center of what it is that you're trying to accomplish. That you're leaving a testimony there for me. Philippians 3.20, but our cit citizenship is in heaven. Beloved, that overrules any citizenship you have. It overrules your U.S. citizenship, which we all treasure. It overrules our citizenship as an inhabitant of earth. Our citizenship is in heaven, and from it, what? We await a Savior. He's coming again. The Lord Jesus Christ. Priorities have changed. 
We need to make sure that there are not too many loose ends from this life tying us up and tangling us. We need to make sure that our loins are girded, looking for and being entangled in the things of God rather than the things of earth. We were, um, we were watching the Academy Awards. I, not this past year, might have been the year before, I'm not sure which year, but um, one of those years. And you hear all these people uh, coming up and their whole life is dedicated to getting this little gold you know, statue to put on the fireplace, right? They are all about seeing and being seen and looking glamorous. That's what their life is. I think the host was uh, Ellen DeGeneres that year, and she, at one point in the, in the program, she said, I'm not saying that movies are the most important thing in the world, because we all know that the most important thing in the world is youth, youth. And I thought as I looked at some of the people, when you saw what some of them had done in order to look young, it was a joke, but... But when you saw what some of them had done to look at it, it wasn't funny. I think it was Kim Novak who was there that year. Sorry to, I mean to pick on anybody, but she was not doing a good job of looking young. <laughs> See, all, what, all they have is now. If this is your ambition, if, you're, if, you're, if your life is all tied up in and what you can get here and now, then, then you have no future to look forward to. And imagine how desperate it must feel if the most important thing in the world is youth or beauty or ambition. Imagine how it feels as gradually that thing begins to fade away. And as it gradually fades away, before long, it's not just gradually fading away. It's going really at warp speed. Seeing as believers, that's not to be our frame of mind. Our frame of mind is I'm laying up treasure in heaven. How fortunate I am to know that youth isn't everything. Beauty isn't everything. Ambition in this life isn't everything. There's something more. Beauty will be renewed. Youth will be renewed. All the things that I send ahead will be mine to enjoy forever. But you have to stay ready. Nothing there to enjoy if you haven't sent it on ahead. We're in a foreign country, beloved, serving our king who will be invading soon. His priorities must be our priorities, not those of this world. See, it's so, it's so easy to get distracted by the things and the hobbies and the habits and the toys. Nothing wrong with any of those as long as we are enjoying them under the Lordship of Christ and not in replacement of the Lordship of Christ. Vast difference there. During the Civil War, again, I don't know if I was reading a Civil War book this week or what, but when I did this, but during the Civil War, President Lincoln's constant struggle, his constant struggle was that as many generals kept demanding more supplies. We can move, but only we need, you know, X number of these and Y number of those, and we can't move until we're ready. And they, and they kept asking for more supplies. And Lincoln, though he was doing his best along with his administration to supply his army, began to realize that they might lose the war, not because they were lacking supplies, but because of the abundance of supplies. So in 1862, still relatively early, he wrote to General McClellan, George McClellan, who was famous for being wonderful. The troops loved him, and he got them all in shape, but he never moved. He was paralyzed by fear of failure. Lincoln wrote to him at one time, and he said, this expanding and piling up of impedimenta stuff has been so far almost our ruin and will be our final ruin if it's not abandoned. Things can weigh us down, beloved. Things changed when Grant and Sherman got in command. You remember that. Sherman made his march from Atlanta to Georgia by leaving his supply lines completely behind. Nobody had ever done that before. Just lived off the land. Broke the Confederacy's back. They were finally learning what Stonewall Jackson knew way back in 1862 in the Valley Campaign when he said this. He said, the road to glory cannot be attended by much baggage. He's right. We're either living primarily for here and now or we're living primarily for there and then. We have to have a foot in both, 
But there is a priority. The priority is to be unencumbered. Be unencumbered. That's one way we anticipate his coming. Second way we anticipate his coming is by being enlightened. By being enlightened. Verse 35 again. Stay dressed for action. Be unencumbered. And keep your lamps burning. Be enlightened. What does it mean to keep your lamps burning? Well, light, lamps in the Bible typically are referring to what? To knowledge and to truth. Oftentimes, most often, to the Bible itself. Psalm 119, 105. What your, your word is a, is a lamp to my feet and a light to my pathway. It's the word that lights our way. And Jesus is saying, don't let your lamp go out. Let your lamps keep burning. You're children of the light. In other words, now act like children of light, not like children of darkness. We read it in 1 Thessalonians 5 today. Live like it. Jesus is do it anytime, so live like he's coming back. Live in accordance with the instructions he's given. Oh, be obedient to what he said. It's your wonderful privilege. It's not your duty. It's your privilege to live in the light. Keep your lamp burning. Understand what the Bible says. Live what the Bible says. Don't let the light go out and return to your old selfish lifestyle. Don't go back there. You know, God, God didn't, God didn't tell us about the second coming so that we could, you know, study in detail and make all these notes and know that, wow, this guy's going to do this and that person's going to do that and, you know, the Antichrist is going to have a beard, I'm pretty sure, because of something that says... I mean, those are all wonderful things to study and to learn and to know, but that's not why God gave them to you. You know why God gave, him, gave us instruction about the second coming? So we would live like it's going to really happen. You read the passages that relate to the second coming, you'll find they almost always go. We read one last week from Peter. They always go to holy living. I want you to know that I'm coming again because I want that to be one of your motivators to living a holy life. Turn with me to Romans 13. Here's, there's, a, there's a wonderful passage there that just spells this out. Romans 13. If you're in Luke, all you got to do is get to John and Acts and then Romans 13, beginning in verse 11. Paul writes this. He says, he says, besides this, you know the time, you know the time, that the hour has come for you to wake from sleep for salvation is nearer to us now than when we first believed. You know, you say, well, we don't know when Jesus is coming. It's been 2,000 years. But beloved, remember, that means it's 2,000 years closer than it was when Jesus said it, right? He's coming. It's time to wake from sleep. Verse 12, the night is far gone. The day is at hand. So then let us cast off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. You live in the light and it'll be like an armor around you. It'll surround you. It'll, all the messes that are in your life caused by sin, disobedience. Let us walk properly as in the daytime, not in orgies, not in drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and sensuality, not in quarreling and jealousy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the, faith to, for the flesh to gratify its desires. That's pretty clear, isn't it? Obey God. That's how you walk in the light. You know, I caught this message as a child. I don't know what, 9, 10, 11 years old. I knew about Jesus coming again. It was a tremendous motivation to me to live a holy life. I didn't want Jesus to come and catch me doing something. My mom was particularly good at using this. You don't want Jesus to come and find you to know. I, I don't. I, <laughs> far be it from me. But you know what happens? You get older, right? And, you know, you know, Jesus didn't come. You know, he didn't come yesterday. Didn't come the day before. And, and, and pretty soon, yeah, I still believe he's coming, but you just don't believe it's really imminent. Is believe he's coming, but it's, you know, sometime out there. So the motivation begins to dwindle. The motivation begins to, to go away. We begin to be attracted to those things of darkness again. Certainly was that way in my life. And Paul is saying, no, no, don't do that. Wake up. Wake up. 
You're closer now than you were before. You don't know when Jesus is coming. The only way to be ready when he comes is to be ready all the time. You must be ready. This is your motivation. When you're not being ready, when you're not living a holy life, guess what? Your lamp has gone out. Your lamp has gone out. My wife will love this story. She likes dogs. We were in Edinburgh, Scotland three years ago, I think, three years ago. And we're walking down the street of the old city in Edinburgh. Wonderful old city. You know, there's great things there. There's golf, the home of golf. I'll tell you, some of the greatest preaching and some of the greatest, you know, uh, preachers in the world have come out of Edinburgh as well. So it's a great place to visit, given the interest that I have anyway. But as we were walking down the old city, we came to this statue in the middle of the road. Now, all over Europe, of course, there are great statues, right? Statues of important people. Some of them you don't even know because everybody's forgotten who they were, but they were important at some point in time. But in Edinburgh, there's this statue of this little terrier dog. Little dog. That statue's been there since 1872. And the reason that statue is there is because that little dog, whose name was Bobby, belonged to a Bobby, belonged to a city policeman in Edinburgh named John Gray. And John Gray died, and he was buried in Greyfriars Kirkyard. That's why we were there, because many of the covenanters, people who died for their faith as dissenters against the Church of England, are buried in that cemetery. And we were there to see them. Instead, we saw Bobby, but Bobby's there. And John Gray, his master, was buried in that cemetery. But the reason Bobby's there is because for the rest of his life, he would go to the place where his master was buried and just wait for him to come back. 14 years he did that, waiting for the return of his master. Of course, John Gray was never coming back, but beloved, how would our life change if we were living that way concerning the coming again of Jesus Christ? Are you ready? Are you living ready? Are the things that are important to him important to you? You're following his direction in your life. Let me tell you, your, your happiest existence will be if you're keeping your lamp lit, following him, being faithful, expecting his return. One more thing in anticipation of his coming, what do we do? Well, we be expectant. Be expectant. He gives us two ways, two motivations to that in this passage. Verse 36 Luke 12, he says, And be like men who are waiting for their master to come home from the wedding feast, so that they may open the door to him at once when he comes and knocks. At once. That's the emphasis in that verse. At once. The picture is this. Wedding feasts in those days, you know, it wasn't like today where you go to the wedding and you, you know what to expect. It's going you know, to have this wedding and then they're going to have this meal or this reception or whatever, and then you go home an afternoon or an evening, and it's all over as far as you're concerned, right? But not in those days. The wedding might go on for a day. It might go on for two days. It might go on for a week. It might even go on for longer. And so when the master went to the wedding, the servants didn't know exactly when is this guy going to come back. They didn't know. Probably he would give them some hint, but they couldn't be sure. And so what Jesus is saying here is the faithful servant, faithful servants will be ready any time. It could be in the middle of the night. But they will be ready. They will run to the door and they will open the door at once. There'll be no, well, wait a minute while I, you know, pick up these magazines I wouldn't want you to see. Wait a minute while I turn off this show I really wouldn't want you to see. Wait a minute while I clean up. None of that. The faithful servant is ready. The faithful servant is opening the door as soon as the master comes. He doesn't have to get ready because he is ready. See? That's what Jesus is commending to us here. He does, Jesus doesn't say get ready. He says be ready. He says stay ready. Let readiness be your mode of operation. Let that be what defines your life. Have your sins confessed. Be seeking the Lord's will and the things that he's asking you to do. Be moving in his direction where you work, where you play, where you do whatever. 
Let him be the center of your existence so that when he comes, you're ready. Are you ready? Verse 39. But know this, that if the master of the house had known, he's, he's changing uh, parables here midstream. Know this, that if the master of the house had known at what hour the thief was coming, he would have not left his house to be broken into. Different illustration, same point. Thieves don't leave calling cards, right? They don't send ahead and say, I'll be there tomorrow night at 1.30. Be ready. Doesn't work that way. Any of you have been robbed know that it didn't happen that way, did it? You came home and found out that a thief had been there completely unexpected. Or you heard a noise completely unexpected. That's the whole idea of the thieves. And the only way to counter them is what? Be ready all the time. You must be ready all the time. Whatever that means in your case, whatever guards you have to post, whatever big dog you have to have, whatever alarm you, system you have to set, you're ready all the time. Because you don't know when he's coming. And that's the message. And you know, when you think about this, think about it. This is great. Because what Jesus is saying is be ready for me to come anytime. Now think about what that means. That means you're ready to live. Because your life is going to be a lot better, happier, everything else, if you're living it in light of the coming of Jesus Christ. I promise you that. There's nothing the world can offer come close to this, even though we all think so. You're ready to live. You're ready to die. And you're ready if he comes. In other words, you have all the bases covered. If you're ready. But we must be ready. C.S. Lewis always has a way of putting things, right? This is a little bit lengthy, but it's worth it. Listen to it. He says, when the author walks onto the stage, the play is over. He's talking about God. He's talking about Jesus. When the author, the one who wrote this script, when he walks onto the stage of history, the play is over. God is going to invade all right, but what is the good of saying that you're on his side then when you see the whole natural universe melting away like a dream and something else comes crashing, crushing in? This time it will be God without disguise, something so overwhelming that it will strike either irresistible love or irresistible horror in every creature. It will be too late then to choose your side. Too late. That will not be the time for choosing. It will be the time when we discover which side we really have chosen. Whether we realized it before or not, you'll know it then. That's what he's saying. He says, now, today, this moment, is our chance to choose the right side. Prophet, to be ready then, you have to get ready. Okay, those are three things in anticipation of his coming. The fourth item in this passage. How do we wait? <laughs> Here's the aftershock of his coming. The aftershock of his coming. I can't even begin to do justice to this verse. I don't even know how to try and explain it, but look at it, verse 37. We read right over this and don't understand what it's saying. Blessed are those servants whom the master finds awake when he comes. Truly I say to you, he will dress himself for service and have them recline at table and he will come and serve them. Do you ever think about that? Do you even know that verse was in the Bible? Astounding verse. Who is the master who's coming back? It's Jesus, of course. There's no doubt about that, right? Jesus is the one. And at the beginning, his parable follows the local custom. The faithful servants wait expectantly to welcome the master home. 
But then Jesus totally departs from anything that anyone would ever expect. He goes in a direction nobody would have ever anticipated. Because the natural thing to anticipate is the master comes home and if he wants food, the servants go get it and serve it and give it to him and he eats. And Jesus turns that picture completely upside down. He says, no, no. When I find the faithful servants and they've opened the door and they're ready for me and, and they're ready for my coming, guess what? I'm going to dress as a servant. I am going to sit them down to dinner and I'm going to serve them. You didn't know how special you were, did you? Man. To feel the impact of this, I, 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 I don't know how to bring the impact of this home, but look, look with me at Revelation 19. Almost the end of the book. Revelation 19. Here's a description of the second coming of Jesus Christ. Revelation 19 beginning in verse 11, Revelation 19, 11. John says, then I saw heaven opened. And you gotta realize the impact of that is after you've had, you've had 19 chapters of gore and blood and you name it, it's in there. And now suddenly, verse 11, then I saw heaven opened. And behold, a white horse. The one sitting on it is called faithful and true, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes are like a flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems. And he has a name written that no one knows but himself. He is clothed in a robe dipped in blood, and the name by which he is called is the Word of God. John loved that phrase for Jesus. And the armies of heaven, who are those, by the way? I'll tell you who those are. Those are angels. And those are, also un, uh, those are also believers who have died and gone on before us. That's who they are, the armies of heaven. If you have died and gone on to heaven by this time, you will be part of that group. And the armies of heaven, arrayed in fine linen, white and pure, were following him on white horses. From his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. He will tread the winepress with the fury of his wrath of God the Almighty on his robe and on his thigh he has a name written King of Kings and Lord of Lords. He'll be more mighty than anybody who ever lived as a human being. This passage goes on to describe how he quickly rounds up the Antichrist. He quickly puts his enemies down. And then Matthew 25, beginning in verse 31, picks up the story. Don't turn there. Let me just read it. It says, When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. Before him will be gathered all the nations, and he will separate people from one another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats, and judgment follows. The sheep go to be with him on his side. The, 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 the goats go to with Satan and his angels into hell. This is Jesus in the fullness of his power and glory. This is not the baby who came the first time to be born in a manger and to go to a cross in absolute humiliation to hang naked on that cross, suffering not only physical death, but spiritual death for us, for the salvation of our sins and the forgiveness of our guilt. This is not that Jesus. This is the Jesus who comes now as the conquering power for all King of kings and Lord of lords. And having done all that, he will dress himself for service. And have them, faithful believers, recline at table and he will come and serve them. How humbling. We'll wish we'd have served him better, will we not? Is this a literal banquet? Well, here's what I can tell you. It's mentioned all the way through the Bible, time after time. It's described as the marriage lamb of the feast in Revelation 19. I don't know any reason to think it's not a literal banquet. Whatever it is, I can tell you this, it will exceed any expectations we ever had. This is the aftershock of his coming to find out that this king will serve us. I think if we really believe that, it would change our lives, don't you? Comfort and ease and all the rest of it would no longer be our primary goal in life. We want to be part of what he's doing. Jesus 
Beloved, is coming again. If he comes in our lifetime, it'll be too late to put the chains on the car. If you die without him, it'll be too late to put the chains on the car. It's appointed a man wants to die after that. The judgment in order to be ready then, you have to get ready now. That's the message. I'm an old Dodger fan. You all know that. Since 1956, when they were still in Brooklyn. I had the privilege to live for 40-some years in Southern California where Vin Scully's voice carried over the airways in the ballpark, outside the ballpark, everywhere. I loved Vin Scully. One of the many stories I heard him tell was this one. He said there was a Big league, in, big league infielder one time by the name of Gene Freeze. If you're my age, you probably had his baseball cards because I sure did. He's one of the guys I had a whole bunch of. I wished I had more Willie Mays and Mickey Mantles and they were all a bunch of Gene Freezes, but I know he was a baseball player. I had his card. And Vinny said he came in after a night on the town and one of the, when they were in a visiting in another city, playing in another city, came in after a night on the town. He got up to his room. He called the operator and he said, would you please give me a seven o'clock wake up? The operator said, Mr. Freeze, you just missed it. You just missed it. It's after seven. You're too late. You can't get a seven o'clock wake up. Very soon, beloved, we will all, everyone who's sitting here this morning, we will all meet Jesus, either when he comes or when we die. And it may seem like a long time from now. It's not going to be long. Not going to be long. We will all Meet Jesus. And in order to be ready then, on whatever that day is, we must be ready now. It's too late then. The decision for or against him must be made in this life, and to make no decision is to decide against him. But by receiving him as Savior and Lord, if you've done that, you can be ready. If you are a Christian... You've made that decision, that, that turn has been made for you. You've turned to him from sin under the power and urging of the Holy Spirit. Now the question is, are you living with him, living for him? Would you like him to catch you in whatever you're doing when he comes? Are you ready to meet him? I pray you are. If you're not, get ready. Get ready while there's time. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the message. Thank you for how Jesus was so very clear, pulled no punches, coming from eternity to earth. He told us apparently as much about eternity as we need to know. We have a lot of other questions, many of them, but you told us what we need to know. And today, Lord, the message is really clear. In order to be ready to meet you, we have to get ready now. So I'm praying if there's anyone here this morning who's never invited you to be their Lord and Savior, nothing we can do changes who you are, but it does change who you are to us in our life. If there's anyone here like that, and if you've really been tugging on their heart, Lord, as I know you do, would you help them right now to just say in the quietness of their heart, Lord Jesus, thank you for coming the first time. Thank you for dying for my sins, for making payment for the penalty I could never pay except by an eternity of separation from God. Thank you for doing that. And right now, I accept your righteousness in exchange for my sins. I give you my life, best I know how. I pray that anyone who may have done that this morning, Lord, you'll have them Help them have the courage to come and just talk to us so we could give them some literature, not impose on them in any way, just like to help them know what the path is to grow in you. Others of us, Father, perhaps are sure of our salvation. I believe we really have made you Lord of our life, but, but we haven't been living like it, perhaps. The lamp has gone out, been living in darkness, been back with the lifestyle we had before, or at least large parts of it, perhaps. No better time than now to seek your forgiveness, to make the mental changes that are needed, and then to follow up with the physical changes that are needed. 
What a privilege to serve you, Father. Lord, just impress upon us nothing more exciting in life than to be part of what you're doing. To come at the end of 80 years and, and realize, well, I don't have a bundle in the bank, but I've sent a lot on ahead. I'm ready to go. I'm ready for when Jesus comes. Help us to be ready for the sake of our Lord Jesus Christ and also for our own sake. Pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen.